And that, uh, I know we also, the people talked about the global warming lawsuit, the uh, five to four case, and the uh, Supreme Court recently ruled. Let me just quickly tell you how that came about. Uh, in 1999, me and my legal partner, Joe Mendelson, wondered why we couldn't sue the EPA for not regulating global warming gases. And so we petitioned them. Now, this was during the Clinton administration, and, and the EPA called us in and said, you know, we think you got us legally. We think these are air pollutants, and the Clean Air Act is supposed to regulate air pollutants, so we think you guys are right. But when the Bush administration came in, right, they completely closed that down and refused to even answer the petition. So then we sued them, saying this is unreasonable delay. Are greenhouse gas emissions, are they air pollutants or not? And they refused to answer us. We sued them, finally got an answer, and they said, no, global warming is not proved. We then sued the EPA. We were joined by several states. We lost at the appellate level. And then we won five to four in the Supreme Court. And let's just show you, here's two lawyers, and then there's only four of us, now there's eight of us in our organization, who came up with this concept, fought it all the way through, and won a five to four decision. Now, again, I'm not suggesting this is the answer, but I'm suggesting do these two stories show you that this is an important tool in the arsenal that we should not ignore as far as taming corporations. Very, very important. Something I deal with every day, which is how corporations are now actually altering the very nature of nature itself through genetic engineering and nanotechnology. You know, we're caught in kind of a technological dilemma, all of us, which is that we've gotten so used to our technologies that we can't live without them, but now this whole new genre of global environmental threats, we know we can't live with them either. So I think almost everyone in this room would agree that we need to devolve our technologies and make sure they comport with nature and, and, in hu and human nature. They were saying, let's not change our technology or economic system so it fits nature. Let's change nature so it fits our technology and our economic system. And this really is the breathtaking effort that you see now with biotechnology and genetic engineering. Again, they're, they're saying, oh, to change the technology and economic system means the Monsantos of the world are gone. So we're going to change the world so it fits our corporate and technological needs. Let me give you a couple of examples on this. 85% of all the genetically engineered crops in the world have been engineered so they can tolerate more and more herbicide use. They're called Roundup Ready. Roundup being, of course, Monsanto's flagship product, right? Now, you know, anybody who's gardening, you know, if you spray, you know, herbicide on your weeds and it gets on your, your flowers or crop, what happens to the flowers or crop? It dies. Real problem for Monsanto, right? You can only use a certain amount of it. You can't use aerial spraying. So what they did is they genetically engineered these crops. Again, 85% of all the crops in the United States and the world are, are, this is what they have in them. So you can do aerial spraying of the herbicide of Roundup Ready over all the crops. They genetically changed the very permanent nature of our corn, our soy, our canola, cotton. And they're saying, listen, don't worry about global warming. We're going to genetically engineer plants so they can survive drought. Right? So this is really, when you think about genetic and genetic technology, I would give you this context that this is the evolving nature of corporate power to actually change at the genetic and now through nanotechnology, the molecular level, nature itself, so it comports with what we do. I cannot imagine a more dramatic moment in the battle against corporations when they are enclosing the very nature of nature and human nature. Now, the mistake here is to think that technology is neutral and it's only the bad guy corporations that are, are making it bad. That's the mistake, fundamental mistake. Let me give you an example. Let's take nuclear power. What do you need for nuclear power? Uranium, what else you need? Tony? Huge amounts of water. This all costs money, largest capital investment you can ever make, right? Is nuclear power plant, right? You need uh, bureaucracy for safety, right? You need a military elite because of its potential use in the military. You need huge insurance. And you need right, a centralized system of energy, right, you're creating a huge amount of energy. You don't build a nuclear power plant for uh, uh, two blocks in a neighborhood. You're building a huge centralized energy source. This is what I call a totalitarian technology, right? Because the technology is not neutral. Inherent in it is a military elite, huge capital investment, right? Huge bureaucracy, huge centralization of power, literally, and massive use of natural resources. The fundamental thing of any democracy, right, is that that democracy is responsive to you and you can take responsibility for it. These are totalitarian technologies because they are not responsive to us and we cannot take responsibility ultimately for what they do. We have to look at technologies as not neutral, but look at various technologies to see if they are totalitarian. And it is those totalitarian technologies that require massive technocracies to run them. 
They can be corporations, or in state capitalist societies like the former Soviet Union, they can be huge bureaucracies. If you have a massive centralized technology, you will have a corporation or a corporate-like structure technocracy to run it. No other way to do it. So if you really want to tame corporations, you've got to tame technology at the same time. So take solar energy. It has the potential, right, to have no massive corporate money involved, no military elite, no massive bureaucracies, no centralized control of the energy, but individual and community control. So there's a technology that's potential to be democratic. Those are the technologies we have to build our body of our society up if we truly want a democratic society. And if we truly want to get rid of these massive corporations, they can't live on that kind of centralized control. So I would urge you, when you, do, when you all of your work on corporations, remember the idea of the t these technological, basically totalitarian, corporate-run te technological systems. And now that those technological systems are being run by corporations, and they're trying to turn all of nature, including human nature, into a technological system, a very, very dramatic moment for it. We need to fight democracy at the, te at the technology level, not just at the, at, at the uh, political level. Now let me finish with a discussion of the precautionary principles. Everyone here know what the precautionary principle is? Yeah. All right, just really, really quickly. No. When, okay, when a technology, genetic engineering, nanotechnology, nuclear power has potential human and environmental threats, even though the extent of them is uncertain, that should not stop a government from acting to either eliminate that technology or at least alleviate those risks, right? Technology has human health, environmental risks, not like global warming, not completely yet understood. That should not be an excuse not to limit that technology or to do something about those impacts. Very important, particularly with things like genetic engineering. But I'd like to extend, if I can, very important precautionary principle. By the way, the European Union signed on, some really great work being done. I, if you know Carolyn Raffensperger's work, I, I urge you to get on her website. She has a great, great description of this. But I'd like to extend it in the next couple of minutes, if I could. And um, I'd like to extend it in this fashion. Can you ever, can anybody tell me here of anything in nature that reproduces on a supply and demand basis? Right? So, so the Japanese say, you know, we, we want sea urchins. We, we've discovered they're an aphrodisiac. This actually happened about five years ago. So they went to the West Coast. Now the sea urchins didn't say to each other, oh goody, the Japanese want more of us. Let's reproduce, that way we can help all the, the fishermen. They don't know. They just reproduce along their natural cycle. So what happens, the Japanese came in, took all the sea urchins off the west coast, went up to Maine where I saw it happen. Now there's not a sea urchin on the coast of Maine. Okay. Same thing happened with striped bass, same thing happened with Atlantic salmon, you name it, over and over again, right? Nature did not read Adam Smith. <laughs> Our economic system is completely disembedded, in the words of Carl Polanyi, the great economist. We have a completely disembedded economic system. The laws of capital and the laws of supply and demand are the enemy of nature, simply put. There is no way, there is no way that they comport. We're learning this the hard way. So what the precautionary principle is really telling us is any time you are trying to apply the laws of capital or supply and demand to nature, be extremely cautious. Try and figure out what the actual results are going to be. The great trick, the shell game of corporate America is to try and convince us they can somehow greenwash the laws of supply and demand, the laws of market, the laws of capitalism to fit nature. They don't, unless you can show me some aspect in nature which understands this and has read Adam Smith and is going to reproduce at the rate of the consumption required. We have fatally misunderstood the relationship of natural capital to income, right? If somebody gives me a million dollar grant and I give myself a $500,000 salary first year, and you say, how are you doing, Andy? You go, I'm doing great. I'm doing fantastic. Got this house here, this house here, see my new car, really nice. You know? Oh, the boat, oh, the boat, didn't show the boat, right? Next year, how are you doing? It's fantastic, two boats. What happens the third year? I'm broke. I made a terrible mistake. I mistook capital for income, right? I made a fundamental error. That is exactly the error that corporations have fooled us into. They try and use all of nature as income when it's really the capital for future generations and for the survival of the earth. That is why it is fundamentally important, I know we don't often use it, but to understand the market principles and capitalism itself is fundamentally dysfunctional. It cannot fit the laws of nature. It is our job, not only just to fight corporations, but to tame them to re-embed our economy and re-embed our technology into the laws of nature. 
and we're doing it. Nature is reciprocal. Nature has redistribution. We have that through many of our tax things, through organizing, through cooperation. We're already doing it. Seventy-five percent of Americans live in the care economy. They get up every morning not to make a profit, but to take care of something. Policemen, firemen, teachers, librarians, NGOs, government workers. Seventy-five percent of us already are not basing our lives on making a profit by selling something for more than we put into it. We just don't honor it. We call it the service economy, right, which brings up the ideas of people at McDonald's. We are the care economy. Almost everyone in this room is probably part of the care economy. And we need to understand that is the future economy. It has to be the future economy of the earth, not capitalism, but the care economy. Thank you.